dream of apprentices and hardened hackers alike to win the big one. For footballers, there's no greater domestic prize than the double, the league championship and the FA Cup. To the delight of a certain corner of North London and the man I'm after tonight, those celebrations mark the return of both trophies last season to Highbury, home of Arsenal. Today, the Gunners are about to take a gentle plod from this plush hotel in St Albans in Hertfordshire to the mud of their training ground just down the road. The team's last double honours was 27 years ago, and our hero had a hand in both. Two large hands, in fact. He's also had double international honours for England and Scotland. He's a brave heart who's battled through to glory. These days, he's also one of our top TV presenters, and I've assembled a special strike force. Emmanuel Petit. Dennis Bergkamp. Tony Adams. Mark Obermars. Jill Dando. <gasps> Jill Dando? Shouldn't you be on a beach somewhere? Well, I suppose I should really, but I had to be here for the man you're after because this chap and I used to spend many breakfasts together. He is a true TV professional and on top of that, a lovely man. Well, he's had his breakfast already and he's out there on the training ground, mm -hmm. so you go with the other chaps and I'll follow behind. It's better that way. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Bob. <laughs> Bit of a change of career for me. But <laughs> I think you could move your training ground to a beach in the Seychelles, don't you? But I think. Wait a minute. Very good. Very good. Very good. Hello, Bob. Nice to see you. Oh, you <laughs> it's, uh, have got to be kidding. It's, uh, unusual for you oh, to see no, the red no. card. Bob Wilson. You. Tonight, this is your life. <laughs> David Seaman. Oh, yes. And a few others. Chief. But now I have to order you off the field for an early bath. Thank Back you. to our studio. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, folks. It's been a very exciting day so far. Yes. Well, Bob, already here in our traditional flat-back formation, friends and family, including your children, Anna, Robert and John. From the world of football, England coach Glenn Hoddle, Wales manager Bobby Gould, Pat Jennings, and my selection of Arsenal players, Alex Maninga, John Lukic, and manager Arsene Wenger, his new striker, my helper, Jill Dando, and from BBC Sport, Helen Rollison. here is the woman who's been on your side since you were school sweethearts, your wife, Megs. <laughs> Megs, it was at school that Bob started calling you Megs. My proper name's Margaret, but my brother's friends all used to call He's me... more than that now. <laughs> <laughs> They used to call me Maggie and Maggots, and um, Bob says, oh, I don't like any of those names. I'm going to call you Meg. So I've been Meg since I was 15. Much nicer than Maggots, certainly. <laughs> Bob, it's hard to know what label to give you. As a player, you were held as one of the bravest goalkeepers of all time. For more than 25 years, you've been a TV presenter, but you still keep your hand in at football, passing on your experience as a coach. And as a sports presenter, you have to stay impartial when you see your protégés in action. from training Arsenal and England's goalkeeper David Seaman. <laughs> Bob started coaching you when you were still with Queen's Park Rangers. Yeah, that's right. Seems a, a long, long time ago. It now. was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been together ever since. What is it, about nine years? I think it's 11. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the best moment, Bob, was when you was best man at my wedding in the summer. 
the oldest best man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was telling everybody about what goalkeepers used to be like then and what they're like now. Yeah. Like he was comparing gloves and things. He pulled out these green cotton gloves and then Bob pulled out his green cotton shirt. And then his favorite one of all time was, he went, here's my wages. And he brought out a little brown envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then he left the room and came back with a great big sack over him and here's David Seaman's wages. <laughs> There were six more sacks outside as well. <laughs> well but Bob, you're a great friend and you're a great coach. Cheers, mate. Thank you, David. <laughs> now, I'm not sure if there's a traditional toast to goalies, but here's mud in your eye as we recall some of the Wilson ups and downs. <laughs> Just if you can. Mm -hmm. Try to get a move on. Mm -hmm. We're off then, are we? You're off. Okay. Catch us if you can. Catch us if you can. Catch us if you can. Gosh, oh! And a great save by Wilson. Catch us if you can. Catch us if you can. I thought I'd uh, have my arm round a nun here. It has a look of a classic vinyl, doesn't it? I'll, you stitch me up there. Your greatest moment in the game came in 1971. You've described it yourself as a season of fantasy when you were named Arsenal's Player of the Year after playing in every match to help them complete the double. League and FA Cup glory. On a memorable Monday night at Tottenham, when they wanted a win or a goalless draw to become champions, they kept their cool in a hotbed atmosphere. And that goal by Ray Kennedy brought the championship to Highbury for the first time since 1953. Five days later, all the excitement came in extra time. And uh, 27 years on, with their hands on the trophies again, those Highbury heroes are lined up for you tonight. No. <laughs> Skipper Frank McClintock, George Graham, Peter Simpson, John Roberts, John Radford, Eddie Kelly, Peter Marinello, Pat Rice, George Armstrong, Sammy Nelson, Charlie George, and from his home in America, Bob McNabb. Right, let's narrow it down to one. Bob Wilson, this is your life. You're a wartime baby, born on October the 30th, 1941, in Chesterfield, Derbyshire, where your father, Bill, was the borough surveyor, and your mother, Catherine, a magistrate. Your parents were Scots, a heritage you're proud of. You were the youngest of six children. There's your brothers, Jock, Billy and Don, and your sister, Jean. And that's you on the left with your brother, Hugh. You were many years younger than your brothers, Jock and Billy. They were both men of action and both, sadly, were killed in the war. Jock was a Spitfire pilot, Billy a rear gunner in a Lancaster bomber. Your third brother, Donald, died two years ago. But you have another brother and a sister, and they're both here, Hugh and Jean. He's the mentor, Michael, that one. Difficult to believe your brothers, really. <laughs> but Hugh, being the youngest, helped uh, map out Bob's future. 
Absolutely, Michael. Um, he owes everything to me, actually. Um, <laughs> but being the younger uh, guy, um, when we were playing with my uh, friends, um, then when the shirts went down to form the goal, who went in it? Bob, of course. This not only helped him to develop quite a good goalkeeper, but uh, it also developed the real competitive spirit, because he is a competitor. And uh, as everybody else here and all his friends will know, he hates to lose. Golf, whatever it is. It's true. It's absolutely true. He is the mentor. <laughs> Definitely. Didn't you give him a nickname? Yes, we did, of course. I've forgotten that. Um, because of his attitude, he was known as good game, bad game, Wilson, depending whether he won or lose. <laughs> <laughs> good game, rotten game. That is it. A rotten game. <laughs> yeah. Well, at Old Hall Road Primary School, you pose for your first team photo. There you are, clutching an early trophy. Your sportsmaster, 45 years ago, was Jack Hemmings. But, Jack, Bob wasn't your number one choice for the goalie's jersey. No, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't at all keen on keeping goal. Bob wasn't. There wasn't enough activity for him, really. He loved playing out. He played centre-half. He was very, very good indeed. But on one occasion, I can remember, uh, he fell over in a collision and fell onto the floor. And I ran up to him, and there he was looking at me. I'm sure there were tears in his eyes. They usually and he looked are, up Jack. at me and he said, oh dear. I said, come on, Bob, if you're going to make anything at this game, you've got to get up and get on with it. And he has done, hasn't he? Yes, yes thank you. You go on to Tapton House Grammar School and that's where you meet Megs. You star opposite her in a school play, The Princess and the Woodcutter. Age 13, you transfer to Chesterfield Grammar, where you become school vice-captain. You still make the odd stage appearance, including the role of a character from Henry IV, <laughs> called, dare I say, Hotspur. <laughs> you turn out to excel at all sports, and you quickly rise through the football ranks. In 1956, you're selected for an England schoolboys squad. You're in the first English schools party to travel abroad when you go to Germany. And that's homeland of your goalkeeping hero, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't be anywhere without a man called Bert Troutman. I loved him, uh, mainly because I played like him. I dived at people's feet in a crazy way, and uh, I just idolized the guy. I could never be as good as uh, Big Pat and David here, but uh, Bert, I, I could just, uh, I could associate my style with his, and I loved him. The problem was, uh, you know, that he was a German, and we'd had a few problems obviously with my brothers losing their lives. My dad was not too sure about my idolizing a German, but how I wish he could have met him, because I met Bert once. Well, you also play against Northern Ireland in Belfast. It's the first schoolboy international to be played under floodlights. Your performance puts you in the spotlight for one of the country's biggest clubs, Manchester United, but your father had other ideas. Oh, yeah, yes. He, he decided that uh, the maximum wage was a problem and it was a cutthroat business, so... He suggested, uh, amongst more tears, many, many tears, that I should uh, continue my education. And so uh, I had the heartbreak of going to meet Matt Busby, being offered professional terms and uh, having to decline them. So in 1960, with your full-time football career shelved, you go to Loughborough College to study physical education and history. Your fallback career was to be teaching. And I'll never forget those special lessons behind the wheel. Fellow student Nigel Seal and another Loughborough College pal, John Leobold. <laughs> Nigel, what uh, were those lessons? Well, Bob and I were at a dance at Loughborough and we met a girl who I liked and uh, she invited me over for tea the next day. But unfortunately, her college was in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere. I had a car, but I hadn't passed my driving test. And Bob, being the great friend, volunteered to be my instructor. And then he came up with brilliant ideas. We got to her gate. He said, let's change places and pretend that you're giving me a lesson. It may impress her. <laughs> and thanks to your generosity, Bob, it did impress her. And that girl and I got married. And she's still here. <laughs> Uh, a really nice thing about Bob is he's always remembered his old mates, uh, despite all his fame and everything else. And they are old. Uh, they are old. <laughs> In fact, one of our really close mates went to America um, immediately after leaving college. And I know two or three years ago, Nigel and Bob decided to go and visit him in Connecticut, but was held up by blizzards and heaven knows what, finished up in New York, but was very, very determined to get there. And eventually, Bob, of course, you did make it through to Connecticut. And Bob, I was delightfully surprised when you showed up at my doorstep. 
and he's shown up to complete this reunion from America, Turvey. Mike Turvey. While you were at Loughborough, you played as an amateur for Wolverhampton Wanderers. On the way to one game in March 1962, you spot evening newspaper headlines that make your blood run cold. You had already lost two brothers, and now you feared for your sister. Jean, will you pick up the story? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Victor Bomber, uh, it plummeted out of the sky onto our house and completely devastated it. And we were blown out, but um, the sound of the ejector seats really saved our life. Bob came straight to the hospital and saw us, and that put us right. And thanks, Bob, you're a super brother. <laughs> well, obviously, Jean and Dennis fought their way back to fitness, and they were there to see you and Megs married on July the 25th. 1964 at the Holy Trinity Church in Chesterfield. Now, long romances like yours are the sort of thing people write songs about, and a good friend of yours has always been ready to oblige oh, with a serenade. I from know. California, some oh. warm notes from Johnny Mathis. I can't believe it. Hi, Bob. Hi, Megs. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I'm glad I got a chance to be a part of your celebration. I was just thinking about all the times that I've spent. Uh, doing concerts in Great Britain, and all the times you two showed up at my concerts. Um, the golf games that we had together, Bob, and sometimes you let me win. <laughs> and that football game that you took me to at Arsenal, where nobody scored a goal. <laughs> it was fun, though. Here's to good friendship. Here's to you. You had a spell with Arsenal as an amateur, making your league debut in August 1963, while you were still a PE teacher at Rutherford Comprehensive School in Paddington. Well, you signed as a professional for £30 a week, but struggled to secure a place in the first team. But you work at your game, overcoming a number of injuries, and soon become the Gunners' number one keeper. You face up to some great strikers. But my normal target was not a goal mouth. It's our Henry, Henry Cooper. <laughs> Henry, why were you facing up to Bob? Well, it was funny. It was like a role reversal thing. He was just getting over a broken wrist uh, as a footballer, and I, as a boxer, had a dodgy old knee. I had my cartilage out, so they knew how to handle cartilages and all them problems at football games. So I went to the Arsenal and trained with Bob. And I didn't believe footballers trained that much. You were about to do those doggies, didn't you? <laughs> Run up and down the front of the thing. Oh, yeah. You were go. about to fight Cassius Clay at the time, weren't you? Yep, well, Relative we had our world title fight at Ivory in 66. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep, yep, yep. It wasn't, he didn't learn anything from me that time. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, thank you very thank much. You. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Thank thank you. Very much. During a game in the double season, 70-71, you made a save which you have described as your best ever. You were pitched against the might of Manchester United and a certain George Best. Oh, and a great save by Wilson. Hi, Bob. I'm sure you remember that save very well. I remember the year, but you probably remember the time and the day. Uh, I still think you were a little bit lucky, and uh, if I could take it over again, I would. But it wasn't the first of many great saves you made at Arsenal, or the last, and uh, you were a terrific goalkeeper, and not only that, a nice guy, and there's not many of us left. I hope you have a great night with the friends and family, and hope to see you soon. Cheers. Now, Frank McClintock, as captain of the Arsenal side that went on to win the double, what were your memories? Well, my memories of... Bob that season, he had an outstanding season. He won the Arsenal Player of the Year. But he actually made a mistake, a little mistake, that was very costly to us at the time when Steve Highway scored the goal. And we were all a little bit down because we had lost a few finals before that. But so when we eventually won, it was a terrific relief. And Bob was so overjoyed about it. When the final whistle went, he ran onto the pitch and grabbed the nearest guy he could. He was dancing around with him for a couple of minutes. And then when he put him down, he realized it was the referee. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Hugh, the double was a great thrill for the Wilson family. Yes, it was, Michael. And one of the most amazing things about that day was that um, of all the tickets, 100,000 then, 
uh, in those days, um, I got a ticket right by the, the steps coming down. So when Frank had picked up the cup, and I think Bob was just behind, actually, and as they came back down the steps, I was actually standing literally on the side of the steps. In fact, I think we caused a bit of a hold-up. Um, and it was a great day for all of us, including Mum and Dad. Well, you fill your folks with even more pride in 1971 when a change in rules allows you to be picked for the Scottish international side. That's when you became known as Jock McWilson. And we picked you for the Scottish team, Tommy Doherty. <laughs> Well, tell me, tell me, Bob's cap was a very special event, wasn't it? That was a time when the international role was changed and uh, where we could pick uh, a player, although English, of Scots parents. And things were so bad with the national team at Scotland in the goalkeeping sense. Uh, I'd seen Bob quite a lot and he was absolutely outstanding and an outstanding pro and had no hesitation in picking him. Got a bit of stick from the Scots supporters for a spell, but... Uh, the accent was a problem. The accent was brilliant, actually. <laughs> and what did you call him? Jock McWilson. <laughs> we called them a lot of things, but that was one of them. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Still well for doing By 1972, you were being invited to provide your expert opinions for television. And then on April the 30th, 1974, after yet another serious injury, you decide to hang up your goalkeeper's gloves and retire as a player. 40,000 fans say farewell to their hero in your last game at Highbury. But the BBC are quick to select you as front man for their football focus. And Meg's Bob rather fancied himself in front of the camera, didn't yes, he? Yes, he, he sort of, um, he wanted a, a bit of confidence and a bit of confidence boosting when he came home and he said, you know, was it okay? And I said, yeah, it was good, it was really good. He says, what, really good? So I said, yeah, it was fine. But you might just have to watch um, what you're saying next time. So he said, well, why? So he said, well, you did say one word 13 times. And he said, what? I said, yeah, you said tremendous, 13 times, and I had to... He wouldn't believe me until I played the video back and showed him. <laughs> well, it wasn't long before you were proving a tremendous help to another TV newcomer. Saying tremendous 13 times? Now, that's what I call a statistic. John Watson. <laughs> So, John, Bob came to your aid, did he? He did, yes. Um, it was very early in my television career, and uh, Bob was one of the first people I knew. Bob and Megs had a video recorder at their house, because Bob was doing his analysis for television. And um, Bob used to play the videos back of my commentaries and show me where perhaps I could have done better, and we used to go over incidents, and it helped me a terrific amount in the... Uh, it used to take a lot of time. A lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hours and hours. Megs used to bake cakes while we were doing it, you know. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thank you. While your career develops at the BBC, you also become the country's first specialist goalkeeping coach. The Arsenal manager, Terry Neal, invites you to pass on your expertise to a new signing, Pat Jennings. Uh, he was my first goalkeeping coach at age 32. I finished up playing in the World Cup finals at 41, and I reckon Bob had at least five years on my career. Thank you, Bob. And so you become one of BBC Sports' top presenters. Sports Night, Breakfast News and, of course, Grandstand. But in 1994, after 20 years with the Beeb, you switched sides to ITV. There you're teamed with one of the best-known commentators in the business. The 1998 World Cup in France was his swan song. But with people like you at the helm, Bob, I know I'm leaving the game in safe hands. There's only one, Brian Moore. Uh... Brian, your comments on Bob? Well, the quibble that I have is one that Frank made. What were you doing at that near post in 1971? <laughs> <laughs> but what I do know is that, I mean, I'm proud of the friendship we've got. His greatest moment in television, I think, was probably in this last World Cup. What you may not all realise is that he went to all the grounds, he presented the programmes from the grounds with all the problems that that presents. Uh, the real sharp end of television, spoke with great authority, and you were the star of the World Cup, old chap. And I think, if I may say so, Michael, I think there are a few of the critics don't yet quite twig how good you are, but we do know. Yeah. Hey. Brian, thank you.
Glenn Hoddle, your thoughts on Bob and France 98? Yeah, I can only second what uh, Brian said there. Um, what was a difficult time for me at the time after the, coming out of the World Cup, uh, went back to work with Bob on ITV uh, for the semi-final and the final. He's a tremendous man. He spent time with me, uh, many hours in Marseille, I think, after the game, helping me uh, get, get over that, uh, that terrible hurdle that we had to get over. Try to find a drink. Try to find a drink somewhere. <laughs> um, but no, it's been a pleasure working with him. He's a true professional. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, John, although none of you has gone into football, there is another Wilson who might follow in Bob's footsteps. Yes, that's right, because Anna's a nurse and Robert's a photographer. I'm a journalist, so all of his hopes are resting on my son, Louis. <laughs> well, as we can see, he's had a few early training sessions with you, Bob, and hopefully he's on his toes tonight, your three-year-old grandson, Louis. Oh, no. No, no. Well, I'm looking at my watch now, Bob, but there is time for me to remind you of those early days when you were picked to play for England's schoolboys. Your entry in the 1956 programme read, Robert Wilson, goalkeeper, fearless at opponents' feet, idolises and imitates Bert Troutman. That same year, your hero had played in the game of his life in the FA Cup final when he played on after literally breaking his neck. Birmingham counter-attack desperately, but Bert Troutman pounces like a cat. And again. But what's happened? Troutman's down. He's injured. Teammates help Troutman to his feet. He tells the trainer he's all right, but the crowd can see his neck is hurting bad. Over Dave Ewing's head, and Troutman's game as ever. Injured or not, he's determined to pull his weight. And that's time. Manchester supporters go mad with excitement, and no wonder. Many years later, you got to meet your hero. On that occasion, you were stuck for words. But I had something to say, and... I do again tonight. From his home in Frankfurt, Germany, your inspiration, Bert Troutman. Thank you. Thank you. You look well. You look so well. Last words to you, Bert. I always felt flattered about comments Bob made about me. But tonight, it's my turn. <laughs> I'm impressed, Bob, the player, the presenter, and the person. And I congratulate you and your family for all you have achieved. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob Wilson, this is your life. Thank you very much.